to the commission. Uh, she's she's stepping into uh, our world as uh, secretary. Uh, I we we spoke on the phone a bit and exchanged some emails and uh, uh, I'm delighted she was able to join. I just think that's great news. So so welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Hi everyone. Nice Hi Rebecca. Hi. Welcome aboard. Welcome. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have a quorum. We've got Hugh, Phil, Chip, John, Miranda, Paul, and myself. Did I miss anybody? Uh, we're good to go. We have a quorum. The meeting's called to order. I ask the commission to review the minutes uh, from the meeting of January 22. Uh, if there's no objection, uh, I'm going to request a motion to approve the minutes uh, as as prepared. I make Any that motion. Please? Thank you, Paul. A second, please. Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor by voice aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion's carried. The minutes are approved. Uh, certificate of appropriateness applications. Uh, we don't have any. Uh, votes today on C's of A uh, as prepared by the city attorney. So these are all new uh, applications, although you, you may be familiar with one or two of them from uh, uh, prior presentations going back a bit. Uh, as is uh, usual practice, uh, signs get approved very, very quickly. Most of the heavy lifting is done by code enforcement uh, before we even see uh, the sign application, uh, Craig goes through it and uh, prepares or prepares with the applicant uh, a sign permit that addresses stuff like height and size and shape and position on the building and so on. So we're basically just taking a look uh, from a code point of view or from an HPC point of view in terms of appropriateness. All, all the other work is done. Uh, first up, I have uh, for Park Place, a sign for Hudson uh, Roastery, and, and correct me if I didn't get that name right. Uh, who is here to speak for Hudson Roastery? Uh, that would be uh, myself, Tony, and my wife, Carolyn, we're the owners of the store. Oh, good for you. Good morning. Thank good morning. you. Nice to see you. Nice to see everybody. Nice to meet you. Thank you it's good to see you guys. Us. So this is, uh, this is a new venture for you? Yes, it is. it is. Congratulations. Thank you Thank for coming you. to Hudson. Uh, Thank you. Do you know, are you comfortable sharing your screen so we can take a look at your sign? Sure, sure. Sure. Um, I think that I'm not sure how to share I, the screen. Here. Let me see. Take your time. Um. Having trouble with my device. Okay. Um, can we? <laughs> sure. Just bring bring it up close to the camera and and uh, talk about what you got. Okay. So this is the uh, facade of the store as it is right now. Um, down below, the brick to the left and the right, and the glass is existing. The Sign above was the old Sternfeld uh, dance studio sign. It was an illuminated sign. That sign is being removed, and we're replacing that sign with lateral uh, wood uh, pieces. That um, Carol, what, what kind of wood is that? It's it's a a combination of it's actually barn wood, 
and it's a combination of hemlock and pine that's going to be uh, stained in the way that it, it'll accept the stain and, you know, obviously uh, peat polyurethanes. So it's going to be a built facade with the letter lettering on it, which right now is, um, th it's a quarter inch thick metal brushed, um, it's like aluminum. A, a brushed aluminum. And there's a couple of different options. The, the sizes are? The size of the letters right now are? Are 13 um, inches. Yeah, they're 13 inches in height. And spaced approximately three and a half inches. Okay. So it's, it's, and there's no uh, electricity or illumination uh, behind or in front. We're not doing anything over the top. It's really super, I would say, um, in fitting with what's going on uh, within the, the area. It's a flat sign. There's nothing illuminated or projecting into or over the sidewalk. Um, we wanted something that was very straightforward and kind of low key. Um, I think that the product that we're selling inside the store is going to really bring the traffic in. And we love the fact that we're on four park place because we're framing the park and we're visible as people walk up Warren Street. And we're excited about bringing some new energy to that part of the historic district. Um, if you, does anybody have any questions about the material or the aesthetic? Tell me what the, the other devices are underneath with the logo on it. Is that, is that the window treatment? Yes, yeah, those, are in, those are inside. Okay. Those, those are going to be decals that are going to be applied on the inside of the glass. I and understand. Those, that, that, that's our logo. And Hudson Roastery is going to be arced over the top. We are not necessarily going to be on the left or the right of the center glass. The center glass is confirmed and the, the door glass is confirmed. The hours are going to be a hanging sign uh, only because we're not quite sure the hours that we're going to have yet. Okay. Um, this was our latest rendering. The, what we're really um, going forward with is the actual sign above the door and the center window and the door decals. I understand. Uh, I, I don't have any questions, commissioners. Looks good. Very nice. It's a nice, it's a nice sign. Is, uh, is, uh, is Craig here? Is code enforcement here? He was, but well, I, now. I, I see him. Oh, OK. All right, I, I, I saw the application as he sent it out. I believe you all have your, uh, your uh, what do you call it? Your sign permit. So uh, may I have a motion to find the application complete? My motion. Thank you very much, Hugh, and a second, please. I'll second. Thank you very much, Paul and or Miranda. Uh, all in favor of finding the application complete, say aye, please. Aye, aye please. Aye, please. objection? Any nays? None. The ayes have it. Application is complete. May I have a motion to uh, request uh, City Attorney Polidoro to prepare a uh, certificate of appropriateness? Any commissioner? Make that motion. Thank you very much, Paul. And a second from you. All in favor, aye, please. Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? None. In two weeks, folks, you will have your certificate of appropriateness from Code Enforcement Officer Craig Haig. Uh, and congratulations on your new business. Great, thank, thank you, you so much. much. We're looking Appreciate forward to you. having you in the roastery for a coffee, wine, and cheese. Thank you. I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you. terrific. Okay, guys. Bye, Crystal. Uh, next application is a sign, and that is 43 South uh, 3rd Street. And that sign is for uh, Hudson Eye. Who's here to speak for Hudson Eye? I am Phil, um, and actually, what I'd like to do is is adjourn this application um, so we can get the sign permit to Craig and and streamline this a little bit for you. Uh, application is adjourned. We'd be very happy to see you in uh, in the the second meeting of the month. Perfect. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, next application is uh, six two zero Union Street. Uh, and I see a number of familiar names and uh, from 620, who will be speaking for 620 today?
Uh, Ed Anker is going to be giving the main presentation on Mike Finney, Finney Design Group. And Terrific. So Ed, a little background on this. I, uh, I recall in what remains of my uh, uh, synapses that uh, we've seen you guys a couple times before. Your presentation was always quite well received uh, by the commission, but what we didn't get to in any of our prior meetings was uh, having all the, the dashes and dots completed so that we can move forward to a C of A. Is that roughly correct? That's correct, Mr. Foreman. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so what we'd like to do today is uh, is discuss with you the specifics uh, now that we've kind of developed that a little bit further for the exterior material palette and colors, uh, and then have a little bit of a question and answer if, if necessary. That you'll you'll note that the presentation is very similar, uh, if not the same as what you've seen before. We've uh, we've made the lettering a little bit larger, so it's a little easier to see on the screen. Uh, but if it's okay, I'd like to share our screen. So Ed, I, I just want to jump in with a comment to, to sure. uh, probably to get me focused. The commissioners are probably already focused, uh, which is a lot of the overall uh, architecture planning and so on have already been presented. And uh, while we weren't in position to do a formal approval, uh, there was a consensus of the board that we wanted to see you move forward and what we didn't have, and the reason the application wasn't complete at that time, is there was some specificity about the materials that wasn't available at the time because you all were still pondering it. Is, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Um, we're prepared to uh, get into that level of specificity with the uh, HPC this morning. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, also with us today is is our, our client and owner of the project, David Kessler. If, uh, if David, if you wanted to chime in at all, just say hi. hi. Just just wanted to say hello. Uh, th you can take it from here, Ed. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna just share my screen here, quick. Okay, uh, can everyone see this? Okay, that's a white survey. Great, excellent. Um, so I, I wanna get into the, the meat of what we'd like to present today, but just as a little bit of a way of background and kind of introduction, uh, making sure that people are aware of the site. I know most of you are pretty familiar with this piece of pro uh, this property, but uh, just to uh, give you a little bit of context, um, obviously this is the, uh, the existing McKinstry Mansion, uh, approximately 1835 uh, uh, built. The back addition, which is right here, uh, is approximately 1906 construction, and then there were several small additions that were done later uh, for an elevator, um, a patio, a small porch and patio, and then a, a bathroom addition off the back. Um, the property is obviously on Union Street, bound by 7th and Cherry Alley, and the church property to the north, or I'm sorry, to the west. Um, we did include uh, several uh, of the original historic photographs just by way of context to help you understand uh, the lay of the land a little bit. Um, this is obviously the, uh, the upper left is the uh, view from 7th and Union. Uh, this is another view uh, at the corner looking from 7th, at, uh, 7th Street rather. And then uh, obviously the frontage on Union. Uh, this is the back area where the existing porches are currently located, uh, the small bathroom addition, and then you can see the, uh, the elevator addition in the, in the, uh, uh, the distance there. Um, we, again, wanted to focus primarily on the exterior material palette today. Um, so I'm going to jump right to that right now, if that's okay for everyone. Um, if we need to jump back to the floor plans or the landscape plan, we're happy to do that, but I think we'll get right into the, uh, the exterior materials, if that's okay. Please do. Okay. All right. So everyone's seen, um, everyone on the, on the HPC has seen these, uh, these rendered uh, elevations that we've done. Uh, and what we've gone to the next, uh, just it'll pop up here in a second, forgive the lag on the screen a little bit. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit more uh, specific about the types of materials and the, the coloration of those materials. Apologize for the lag, just bear with me one second. As this pulls up, so in, in general, um, you know, the, these are the um, the elevations that we had shown previously, 
And uh, the material for the edition uh, is, is generally fairly monochromatic in, uh, in its appearance. Um, we wanted to keep it fairly subdued uh, and kind of held back, highlighting the, the existing, existing McKinstry Mansion uh, and the associated uh, historic construction on that site. Um, we've chosen a material palette that's, um, like I said, fairly monochromatic. Um, the, uh, the nomenclature hopefully will pull up here. Again, I apologize for the lag. What I'll do is I'll start a uh, discussion from the from kind of the ground and go upwards. Um, we'll focus on the the cherry or sorry sorry on the uh, Union Avenue side first. Um, basically, at the base of the construction, um, we've kind of grounded the building in uh, in what amounts to a brick veneer uh, at the water table. Now, this brick veneer will have a uh, matching appearance in both size. Uh, color and uh, mortar color to the existing 1830s uh, McKinstry Mansion. We've gone and did some, we've done some research on matching that brick. So the intent is that we would kind of tie those two, uh, the new and the old together uh, in the form of that, of that, uh, that water table. Moving up from the water table, um, the, the large portion of what you see in the gray coloration of the, kind of the medium gray coloration that you see here uh, is, is a smooth faced uh, James Hardy product. It's a plank product uh, that we'll be installing, installing horizontally. Uh, and that is uh, pre-finished um, so that number one, it has a little bit higher durability uh, in an iron gray color, which is a very deep, uh, almost charcoal gray color. Um, and then that has a 10-year warranty on the finish. So the durability is there for the long haul. Um, the surrounding areas immediately around the windows in these uh, kind of Juliet balcony areas here, and then also in these dormer areas uh, will be a metal panel. Um, that will be a formed metal panel that will be shipped to the site, uh, basically constructed and then installed. Uh, that's based, the basis of design for that is a Centria panel. It's their in, uh, integrity line. Um, or, and that will be installed kind of surrounding the windows and then bracketing some of the openings and some of the dormers uh, at those locations. You'll see that on, on this facade right here in this elevation uh, and a little bit more pronounced. We have a few different types of, of windows on the project. Um, basically all of the, the, uh, the punched opening windows uh, with the exception of the storefronts that we're using are based around a Pella Architect Series window. Um, the Pella Architect Series window is a historically accurate window. We'll be using um, simulated divided lights with the spacer bars between the glass so as to mimic um, a more traditional divided light, a true divided light scenario. Um, however, we're, we're kind of, creating a difference between what's happening in the hist oh, there we go there. Now you can see the, the green here. We're creating a little bit of a difference with what we're doing in the historic mansion uh, versus what we're doing in the new edition in so much as that the mullion pattern is a little different. Um, the, uh, the mullion pattern on the existing building will be a, excuse me, a six over six pattern, um, which is exactly identical to what's currently, what currently exists in those windows. Um, we know just by way of, of uh, kind of bringing everyone back into the fold in that one. We know those windows were um, approved to be removed. They're completely hazardous material and uh, trying to salvage them would, would do more damage to the facade and to the windows than was, was appropriate. So we're going to be replacing those with new uh, Pella Architect series windows. And then in the addition, we're using a six over one pattern in the mullions. Um, those windows are fairly close to the, close to the, the, the sills are fairly close to the floor. So this will allow an unobstructed view out to the, uh, the patio um, and the grounds uh, surrounding the, uh, the site. Immediately adjacent to those windows that you see in the dormers here, and then also in the construction of the, uh, the atrium space, which is housing the restaurant, um, we're specifying around an aluminum storefront system uh, a Conier Trifab 451 Ultra Therm, a UT is Ultra Therm. Um, most of those panels are fixed glazing. However, on the ground floor that go out to the patio, uh, we'll be using a sliding glass uh, door there. Those are an AA3200 thermal sliding door uh, that are made to fit specifically within the curtain wall, or sorry, within the storefront system. We don't have any curtain wall in this. Um, and then addition, additionally, the gasket that we have that connects the, uh, the original historic mansion to the new construction is also that aluminum storefront system. So tucked into these dormers that protrude from the face of the building and then create these porches and balconies, um, we have actually a, a recessed and natural cedar product. Um, that'll, be, um, that'll be a clear matte finish on that, appropriate for exterior use. Um, 
and that's a that's a small portion of the of the percentage of the facade. However, it's an accent for those dormers, and then that accent carries into what's going on in the rooms immediately above the guest rooms immediately above that. Um, on the uh, on the back of the building, or on the wet, or the uh, Cherry Alley side, um, in the existing 1906 building, there's a, essentially a parged. Uh, masonry foundation uh, kind of forming a water table where, where we will be replacing some of the windows on the back of the building. Um, what we wanted to do in the new construction was mimic that in both scale and, and size, however, create a more durable long-term finish there. So we're proposing using an architectural CMU, uh, which would have a ground face similar in texture to the existing. Um, however, it's, a, it's a, a masonry product that'll stand up to the abuse uh, from plow trucks and garbage trucks and so on and so forth on the alley while still maintaining the, uh, the aesthetic along that facade, albeit not as, as important as the Union Street facade or the 7th Street facade, but we wanted to pay particular attention to make sure that we were addressing all the, the uh, faces of the building. And again, along the back side of the building, uh, the same James Hardy um, iron gray cement board siding. Um, and then on the top of the building, uh, on, the, on the new addition, we're proposing a standing seam metal roof in a similar color, uh, charcoal gray, uh, and that's based around an Angler product. Uh, they make a standing seam product for many, many years and they're very, very durable. Uh, and they carry a pretty significant warranty, which is part of the reason why we're, we're choosing them, not only for aesthetics, but also for durability long-term. Um, and then on the existing uh, 1906 and 1830s vintage buildings, um, the existing roof was, uh, the original roof was replaced with a synthetic slate roof. Uh, we don't know exactly the vintage of that, but that synthetic slate has um, all but failed, unfortunately. Um, it was a product that uh, had a lot of manufacturing issues uh, right after it was installed. Um, so we are proposing to replace that synthetic slate with new synthetic slate to match the existing in a similar color to what currently exists. It's, a, it's kind of a medium uh, dark gray on that, um, on that surface. This is uh, based around Inspire product. Uh, it's a synthetic slate manufacturer uh, for the roofing. Along the front of the building uh, and the existing 1830s mansion, um, one of the most important things that we found during our historic research was that the existing porches were actually quite beautiful, quite nice. Um, however, they were um, kind of torn off the building and replaced with a uh, pipe uh, column and concrete uh, attachment, which really isn't historically accurate or appropriate. So we're proposing to remove those porches and replace them with uh, porches that are designed to be in, in congruence with the original historic facades. So we're replacing the uh, the porches on the on the Union Avenue side, and then all the railings associated with it will be a decorative aluminum railing system, uh, likely in a matte black finish, uh, which will mimic more closely what was originally there, as best we can tell from the historical uh, photographs that we have. And we can get into the renderings, which dictate this or which uh, which indicate this a little bit more. Um, I'm going to switch to the next. Uh, the next set of images, and this is the uh, the shorter facades along 7th and then also along the uh, the property line on the opposite side. And again, very much the same palette of materials, um, the hardy clapboard siding. Uh, we have a small area of board and batten in the eaves just to kind of give a little bit of uh, textural difference between the areas of the facade, excuse me, areas of the facade. And then again, same window types with the six over one treatment on the new and then the six over six treatment uh, on the existing 1830 and 1906 buildings. The, uh, the architectural CMU wraps around the corner of the building, again, for durability, but also for maintenance. Uh, this uh, large portion of this, this facade is tucked in behind uh, the existing bordering building, so you don't see a ton of this. Not until you get to this kind of portion of the building do you start to see that uh, brick veneer. So we, we're switching to that a little bit more um, historic uh, facade material and using the brick veneer down at the water table. Uh, which will mimic again the uh, the 1830s facade. And then um, just kind of walking through, I'm going to flip to the renderings here. And we haven't labeled these as, as much as we have before, but I'll talk through some of the materiality there. And again, you can start to see these aluminum storefronts, which are based around the Conier product. These sliding glass doors here will open up so that the restaurant and the patio have a direct uh, visual and uh, physical connection. Um, and then um, you start to see in the facade, this monochromatic, these uh, balcony areas right here in the dormers would be the metal panel. And then tucked inside those metal panels, just to give a little bit of highlight with some natural materials, uh, is that cedar, the horizontal cedar in a natural finish.
to flip to the next facade here. Um, and again, you can see this, this construction of this matte black finishes in the atrium space, the dual height atrium space, those will be built up uh, columns out of likely a composite material. And then that, uh, that will be painted um, kind of, again, matte black to kind of suppress that and highlight what's going on behind the facades in the historic uh, portions of the building. This is again, another image from Union Ave, just zoomed out a little bit more. We wanted to highlight the, uh, and again, and most of you have seen this, but wanted to highlight the kind of reconstruction of these historic porches and some of the railing systems that we're proposing for there. Again, matte black railing systems, very similar um, to what we can glean was in the original construction of the building. Um, also wanted to highlight the fact that we're removing what is right now the uh, elevator uh, core on the back side of the building. We're putting a new elevator in the new building, which will be much more appropriate for the use of the building, but restoring that historic facade back to its original glory um, and facing the uh, the beautiful gardens that we're going to be installing along, along Union Ave. So again, you start to see, uh, again, keeping those trees, uh, the, the construction of the facades. And again, we haven't really changed uh, at all the, uh, the garden planning that we had produced and provided to you at, at earlier meetings. I'm gonna move to the next facade, uh, which shows a little bit more zoomed out view uh, and kind of highlights the um, yeah, kind of suppressing the addition slightly. Still, it's a, it's a fairly large addition, obviously, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we were still highlighting the, the main facade of the, uh, of the 1830 McKin Street Mansion as it fronts on 7th and on Union. Uh, just bear with me one second while this pops up. I would uh, welcome any questions throughout the, throughout the uh, presentation here. We're getting to the point where it probably makes sense for a little Q&A as this uh, pulls up. So if anybody has any, any thoughts or questions, please uh, chime in. The uh, synthetic material you're proposing for the uh, synthetic slate, is that uh, cementitious or uh, fiberglass or what is the material of the synthetic slate? Yeah, it's a, it's a composite material. It's, it's made up of, a, it's partially cementitious and there's partially a fiberglass reinforced product in there. Um, it's, it's inspire roofing. It's, um, I mean, it looks very similar to slate. It has a, it has a cut edge, almost like a chipped edge, very similar to what's up there now. Um, unfortunately the product that was installed, um, was, was not a, uh, they had a lot of manufacturing issues with it. So we'll be replacing it with a product that will hopefully last a lot longer. Um, the anticipation when putting a synthetic slate roof on is that you get a 50 year lifespan out of it. And we intend to do that with this new product that we're going to be installing. But fundamentally, uh, aesthetically, it will not be any different than what's what's up there now. Just uh, functionally, it's going to work a lot better. Protect the building. Sure. And particularly interested in the thickness of that, because some of those synthetic slates get really heavy and chunky. I mean, I think it's, it's nice to have a chipped edge that gives it a natural uh, slate look. Uh, but um, if it's a reinforced glass reinforced uh, uh, cementitious material, I'm assuming that that's relatively thin, like a traditional slate. Correct. Uh, it mimics the thickness and also the kind of manufacturing process of a more traditional um, a realist real slate product. Um, so the look is very very similar. And it's also 35 feet in the air too. So. <laughs> and I had a question about the. Uh maybe not the correct term, but sort of the fenestration strategy on the on the new structure. You 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 uh, went to uh, six over one. Was that uh, uh, of, of the intent to differentiate from the six over six and the other parts of the building or or is that is that an artifact of, of the technology or the systems that were available to use? Ed, maybe I could jump in on that yeah, one. Yeah, go ahead, Mike, sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things, just trying to follow some of the, some of the um, historic preservation standards, is that to have the addition um, complement and um, the old building, but also feel distinctly new. Sure. Differentiating between the existing historic windows and then the new proposed windows, so they're you know a similar profile and proportion, but um, we're not copying them exactly. Okay. We wanted them to be sort of distinct and set themselves a little bit apart. Terrific, thank you. Sure. 
this is just that uh, that other view kind of zoomed in, uh, kind of highlighting the, the addition a little bit so you can start to see the materiality. Uh, again, the very traditional uh, horizontal clabbered trim around the windows, which would be in a, a, a complementary uh, shade and color. Uh, and again, kind of creating that mono, monochromatic look, which is, um, you know, has a historic precedence to it, but kind of creating a little bit more modern interpretation of some of those materials and materiality. Other thoughts, questions, concerns? Commissioners, well, I, no, I mean, we, we've seen this, I, I think well, actually twice before right. in uh, different right. iterations, but uh, the specificity you're providing on, on the materials and the explanation of those materials has been very helpful. So I thank you very much for that. Uh, I also pleasure. assume you're you're in in good standing with with any other commissions and whatnot. And once you get your C of A, you guys will be able to proceed. Thanks, Phil. Correct. Hello, Correct. Phil. Yeah. This is Craig. I'm having some technical issues. Can anybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Very clearly, Craig. Okay. okay good. Um, <clears throat> this application is. It, has there been a certificate of appropriateness issued on this? No, Craig, what, what we did is we, we sent a memorandum so sort, of, sort of vaguely in the form of a certificate saying that we generally uh, supported the design and, and strategy being taken on, the, on, on this, but, but this is the first time we're actually uh, up for looking to, to produce a C of A. Okay, good. That's all I need to know. Sure. Commissioners? Or if we if we're if we're good, I hope we are. Uh, I would love to uh, ask for a motion to find the application complete. I make that motion. Thank you very much, Paul. He was second. Uh, all in favor of uh, waiving a public hearing uh, and finding uh, this application complete, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? None. Application is Just found know complete. that you've held a public hearing on this because it is a substantial project. Yeah, but Victoria, you would have asked me to waive another one. No, I know. I'm just noting for the record for the public that you've already held a public hearing and so you're waiving it because the changes are not significant from what was already presented. I thank you for that. And I was teasing you. Uh, may I have a motion to uh, approve the application and to request City Attorney Polidoro to prepare a certificate of appropriateness. I make that motion. Paul, thank you very much. A second, please. So moved. Miranda, Miranda. done. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, there are none. Motion is carried. Uh, you will have your C of A in two weeks. Uh, stay in touch with uh, Code Enforcement Officer Craig Haig. Uh, and that's the place where you get your, your, your C of A. And congratulations, all y'all. It's been a journey. Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. We really, really appreciate your time. So, so th Great job. Thank you. Th thanks a million. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Uh, 608 Columbia Street. Who's here to speak for 608 Columbia? Hello, that would be me, Willie Miesmer. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing fine, thanks. Can you hear me and see me OK? All, all good. So tell us a uh, big picture about your project. And then if you could share your screen, that would be terrific. Sure. It's it's not a terribly big picture um, compared to the last uh, project that you guys <laughs> no, that was had. Very big. <laughs> yeah. Uh, essentially, in a nutshell, um, I own uh, uh, the house at 608 Columbia Street. And we, as you probably gather, we live on the truck route. Um, so there's quite a bit of noise coming from the street. And while the building, uh, I believe, was built in eight, 1892, um, I think the windows were installed sometime in the Renaissance, so they're quite old um, and need to be replaced, as you can tell um, by my gallows humor about it. Um, yeah, so it's a window, uh, window. It's a street side facing window replacement project in a nutshell. Um, I am so willing to do whatever you guys uh, <laughs> want me to do. I just, if you want the windows to be 
translucent, you know, pink, that's fine. No, 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 I, no, don't, don't go there. Just uh, share your screen so we can visualize what you're talking about. So this is what my, hold on one second. I'm just gonna do this right here. Share. Can you see? Um, yes. Did have sort of like a PDF open. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is the front of my lovely uh, home, which is great. Um, so you can see we are just dealing with these five windows for this project. Um, as you can see, the bottom two are one over one. They're more recently um, finished their, 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 their vinyl, um, whereas the, the top three on, on the second floor are the original glass from God knows when and are in a six over one pattern and are extremely uh, sound, not, they're unsound. Um, so then, I don't know if you can see here, just a little bit of detail of the first floor, the casements are degraded, the window frames themselves are degraded, um, they need to be replaced. And then moving to the second floor, that's sort of the closest picture I can get, um, but you can see um, they're pretty old and in need of some love. Um, and I just included an interior view to, you can see like there's quite a bit of degradation. Um, so what we are proposing to do is um, replace, oh yeah, and then finally uh, my neighbors on the right and left, um, they have nicer looking windows than us. So we're jealous of them. Um, so what we're proposing to do is put a, Sorry, can you see this now, a new PDF? Oops. So this is a not terribly detailed rendering of the Marvin primed pine exterior. Uh, they're going to be white. They're going to be simple looking. We'll go with the six. We're not seeing your new screen. Oh, you're not. Okay, one moment. Thank you for that heads up. Um, let's see here. What about now? No, no. I'm gonna do a new Not share. Yet. I'm gonna do a new share. I, I, I see where I am. How about now? Here we go, yes. Awesome, thank you for that. So yeah, so these are a Marvin primed pine exterior. They're going to be white, they're wood, they're pine. Um, we're going with the six over one pattern, but if you'd like, we can do six over six. We can do whatever. Uh, feels right to preserve the historical character. Um, so yeah, that's this, for the bottom floor, we're going with the six over one as well as for the second floor. Um, so that is the information that I have. We're working with a, a carpenter named Norman Douglas who has worked on historic or buildings in the historic district in the past. Um, he's going to be repairing the casements on the first floor, um, but not fully replacing them. Whereas on the second floor, we will need to fully replace the casements um, per his recommendation, just because it feels like the wood is just beyond um, being salvage. It's not, it's beyond salvageable. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, does that make sense? Did I leave anything out? I'm sure I did. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Are these single glazed windows or double glazed? So actually, we're going to go triple. Oh, OK. Because um, sound, as I've mentioned, is a concern. And <laughs> yeah, so we're just going to go for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Commissioners, any other questions? Perfect. I'm sorry, Chip. Uh, yes, I do have a question about the Moylean pattern of the six over one, which um, do, do you have any historical photographs of the building that shows an original Moylean profile uh, for any of these, your, your building or your immediate neighbor's buildings that looked like they were built at the same time? Yeah, I, th I think they all were. I, I 
sorry to interrupt. I don't actually, I wasn't able to track down um, any historical photos. I did attempt to um, through the city um, and through, I forget the other office that I called, but um, none were available. Um, but as I said, like, if I can just, you know, the, the, the windows on the second floor, can you see the original? Maybe. I, yes. You can. Okay, great. Yeah. So these windows I'm told are the original windows. Um, if you can believe that. Um, so that's, that's, that's as close as I can get. I'm sorry. I wasn't able to get like, uh, mm -hmm. old photographs, but, um, yeah. Those windows match your neighbor to the right also, right? Can you show us that picture? Yeah. Well, they're six over six on the right. Yeah. On the second floor, they appear to be six over six. Yeah. It's just that it's not, it was not uncommon for occasionally the bottom sash to be replaced and replaced with a single light rather than a six light. So that those second floor windows that you have there may the second floor, I'm sorry, the upper sash of the second floor, the six lights may well be original. The, the bottom half of that might be a replacement or a modification. Yeah. Not uncommon for that to, not uncommon for that to happen. Right. A, a building of this vintage, uh, and you said in the 1860. I think it was um, 1892. I'm, I'm 92. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I don't. I, I I really don't know whether it would have been a six over one or a six over six. Just posing the question, really. Um, Jeff, lacking. Feel free, to, feel free to weigh in. The applicant has said that they're uh, totally uh, open to either of those solutions. And and if you have fr from your pretty considerable experience a, a view on that, go with it. I would just ask, um, it is a 10 week lead time to fabricate the windows and we are trying to get going on this. So um, I just would humbly request if 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 you want a decision i would like a decision <laughs> uh sure I, I get that sure there's any anybody else on the board anyone else on the board have an opinion about the light division well generally speaking when we have a an old window in place and we, we generally say like for like, which is what's happening. Um, you know, I'm fine with replacing them with like for like. But again, if the owner has a specific leaning towards one or the other, I would leave it to them. I think both work historically. Okay. Anyone else? Nobody else. Uh, so we to in for the sake of uh, uh, specificity, wh which way are we going on this, uh, uh, Willie? Um, I, if it's okay with you guys, I would just go with the six over one pattern for both the second floor and the bottom floor. Okay, then that's your presentation. Great. Okay, may I have a motion to find the application complete? Motion. Anyone? Hugh, thank you. In a second, please. Anyone? I'll second. John, John. John, thank you so much. And John is the second. Uh, all in favor by voice, aye. 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 Are there aye. any opposed? None. The application is complete. May I have a motion to waive a public hearing and request the city attorney to prepare a certificate of appropriateness. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, this will be as presented as uh, six over one. Uh, anyone make that motion? I'll make that motion. Thank you very much, Paul. And a second, please. Second. Second. Oh. Second. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Senator Like Hugh and Miranda. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? None. Uh, applications approved. We'll request the city attorney to prepare a C of A. Uh, Willie, you should stay in touch with uh, Code Enforcement Officer Craig Haig. Uh, we. Uh, when the city attorney prepares the, the certificate, we actually vote on it in another two weeks, uh, just as a matter of process, and you'll pick it up from Craig. 
Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for your presentation today. Appreciate your time. Be well. Thank you. Uh, where am I? That was Columbia Street. Yes. And we're heading back to Union Street. We have an application for 502 Union Street. Is the applicant here? Yes, we are here. Oh, terrific. Um, thank you, everybody. And uh, apologies that we uh, need to take your time up with us again. Um, you had kindly previously given us approval, uh, but we ran into a little bit of difficulty, which was that the uh, roof structure was um, coming out heavier than the steel frame was able to support in the building. And so we're back um, with some changes to the roof um, that um, will uh, lighten the additional load and also some changes to the facade where we ran into a similar issue. The steel frame inside the building is an interior frame that does not go all the way out to the walls. And so some of the changes to the walls that we were hoping to make um, can't be made basically on a, uh, a structural basis. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Joni um, from Glow Architect and she and Stephanie together prepared um, these new uh, drawings and uh, we hope um, you will still like them despite the changes. Thank you very much. Joni, you're muted. You're muted, Joni, you're gonna have to start that over. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, I'm sharing my screen right now. Can, can everybody see this? Uh, so this is the site plan that we um, submitted for um, pre-approval. And um, as Albert noted, um, you know, the most drastic change is really a reduction in the footprint. We had to eliminate the greenhouse, unfortunately. And so now we um, just have a single kind of volume that is roughly in the same position as um, the solarium that we had previously for the penthouse, except we've just shifted things a little bit to take advantage of structural alignment. So, it, you know, think the, the footprint rests exactly on the structure below and stuff, making it as um, efficient as possible. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna go to this. And so here is um, a slightly more descriptive plan of that where it's kind of oriented. So we have uh, Fifth Street to the bottom of the page, Cheriality to the left, and then Union Street to the right. Um, as I mentioned, just one single volume. There's more of like the, the kind of green roof that's also been kind of reduced in intensity. We had a tree that was removed. Um, and then everything else really is kind of remaining the same. Um, the sort of the brick spine that we had along the east end has been really reduced. So everything's just kind of contained in, in this singular volume. We had a stair accessing the roof previously to the south side, which has been eliminated. Um, so here are views of the um, kind of simplified penthouse structure. And, and as you may notice almost immediately, uh, yeah. this is also no longer a brick facade. Uh, that the brick was the material added change. a ton of weight. Absolutely, absolutely. So now we've kind of moved from a brick cladding to a standing seam metal product that is considerably lighter. The, the thickness of the walls is reduced pretty drastically. The finish that we're contemplating is a powder coated finish in a very kind of light, soft um, dub gray. We think this sort of gives a nod to the industrial past while still kind of like allowing the base building to be itself um, and creating a sort of um, a separate kind of area up here that's like kind of um, not, it's, it's kind of its own structure and kind of like a lighter touch. We still have these Clara stories to um, the side that faces the Catskills. The canopy has really remained the same. A lot of these details in the baseball thing are, are, are very much what you've seen before. So nothing's changed here. On the Cherry Alley side, the major change is where we originally had a large window looking into the cafe. We've split into two windows that utilize the existing rough openings that also allow us very importantly to drop a column between them to, to support that edge of the structure. So same um, details here on, on the Union Street side where the um, brick detailing originally was an Audi. We've kind of inverted it to be an Innie, which is a lot less um, structurally on onerous. It's a lot easier to support, uh, but we still have, um, we get to maintain some of the plasticity of the facade and uh, preserve this sort of architectural feature. 
The windows, as I mentioned, um, the products are the, still the same. So here we've just split it into two windows and um, they're basically identical and aligned with the four bedroom windows above. Um, Fifth Street, the elevation on the base building hasn't changed much, but you see the reduction in the, the rooftop. And then on the Union Street side as well. Um, one other change we made was that um, in order to kind of, the garage door was uh, requiring a lot of additional structural reinforcement. So we switched, we switched that up for a, um, a sliding door. We're still working with Alamalco. So the, these, these products and um, the details remain the same as what you've seen before. Um, and then for the cladding on the rooftop, we're using a standing seam metal product, like I mentioned. And we put together an appendix so you can just kind of see the before and the after um, the penthouse structure as previously approved. Um, and then the standing seam prop uh, proposition on the right. Does anybody have any questions or want me to flip to, uh, back to any of the images? Joni, just to be clear, we this this was this is an approved was an approved application uh, as you demonstrated in the split screen, and if you could just top line, uh, you don't have to go slide by slide, but the but the changes as I understand it are primarily the penthouse. Yes, absolutely. Correct. Uh, and the external material. Uh, the uh, garage door concept is now sliding door. Yes. Correct. Uh, and what were the other changes again? On, on the uh, north side to Cherry Alley, there was one large window, which is now split into two windows so that Got we it. can have a column. Um, again, this has to do with how the interior frame of the building works. Understood. Uh, weight distribution and all yep. that good stuff. All right, I understand that. Thank you very much then. Uh, that helps me a lot. Commissioners? Uh, if, I think if, it looks great. I think yes. it looks extraordinary. It's a beautiful, yeah. it's a beautiful. I agree process. with John. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's a shame the change, the change is necessary. Sorry, Miranda. No, I just say it's a shame you had to lose the greenhouse, but you've done it beautifully. And I think that the new siding on the top is terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's very yeah. successful. Thank you for the really accurate comparison of approved and amended. The motion to find the application uh, uh, complete. Anyone? I make that motion. Thank you very much, Paul. Is there a second? Second. Second, Hugh. Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor of finding the application uh, complete, say aye, please. Aye. aye. Uh, any nays? There are none. The application is complete. A motion to waive a public hearing and to request City Attorney Polidoro to prepare a certificate of appropriateness. That motion. Anyone? Make that motion. Thank you very much, Paul. And a second. Hugh? Sure. Done. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Approved. Terrific. Really cool job. That, that thank was you so much. We're so relieved you like it. <laughs> yes. No, thank you. Thank you. And, and we really appreciate all the thoughtfulness in the process here. So thank you very much. Okay. Mutual. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye bye. Fifty nine Allen Street. Who's here to speak for Fifty nine Allen? That would be me. Hi. Could that be Walter Chatham? Hello. Hello. Um, before I start, I would just like to say my jaws on the floor at the quality of the work that you guys are reviewing, and I'm just so pleased to be in a meeting where everybody is working together to make Hudson the most amazing place it can possibly be. So hopefully <clears throat> we will be making a small contribution to that in our um, presentation. Uh, a little background, I think you all know this building. It's the hulking Gothic ruin uh, looking over the old seaport. Uh, every horror story should have one. Um, you know, it was yellow for a while and you, I'm sure you've been tracking um, the progress in fixing the outside. We've now 
uh, had been able to get it cleaned up inside and been able to do a proper inventory and survey of what we've got. And we've really got something. Um, I think at some point, uh, you know, there's, there's photographs in that booklet that I gave you, but um, I really think it might be a Davis house and I'm not qualified to say that, but um, you know, I've got really good detective instincts and I see his footprints and his fingerprints everywhere and I'm just gonna pursue this relentlessly. But the reason I mention that is it, it lays out for me a very clear path here because rather than uh, being the imaginative architect I would like to think of myself as, I've really tried to slavishly look at Davis's work and analyze as many projects as I could and find projects that bore similar handprint and footprint to this project. And so, you know, whether you agree with what I'm presenting or not, I'd just like to say that everything I'm showing is intended to be what I believe the original house looked like. And so with that, um, so I assume, can you, you see this, I assume? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, so many of you are familiar with this rendering, which um, really is the only pre 20th century uh, information that I have to, to work with. But um, having studied the uh, record very carefully, I noticed things like this way of showing an outside material appears in many of Davis's renderings. This um, very interesting kind of, I'm gonna call it a Christian because it's got a kind of cross, a kind of um, trifle cross at the end, um, <clears throat> tracery, these things that look like they were lifted out of a local cathedral. Um, there's all evidence that that did exist on this house. In addition to this engraving, we have witness marks, everything. So um, I just wanna say that we're working with Peter Borland who did, uh, many of you know, the train station, the uh, up, Hudson Upper Depot. And I'm excited to say that Peter's windows have gone into that as of this week. So you can go by and look at what we're doing up there where he had a, a double hung historic window to deal with. Here we have existing casement windows in the attic and in the basement with nothing but double hungs and filled in openings between. So um, we believe there's evidence and I'm not gonna bore you all. I'm gonna be very quick in going through my presentation. So this is the, the big part now before we look at the pictures. Um, I'm pretty sure we had either uh, identical windows to what we had in the basement or some variation. So that's what you'll be seeing. We're going to be uh, taking the basement windows out, taking them apart, analyzing them, making sashes and so forth. And this is really the process that was done up at the Hudson Depot. So um, with that, let me just say these very small uh, vignettes lead. Uh, so the, the existing basement, this is actually the plan that's measured in there now. We've cleaned it out, it's virtually untouched. This must be the same plan that existed when the house was built. This was the original kitchen. As with many of these houses, there was a service pantry here and we found that there's a dumbwaiter that follows Davis's prescription for size and layout here that must have gone up to the dining room above. And at some point, uh, very quickly, either there's disagreement, either this was put on as a wing or the entire house was built as a piece and this area very quickly became the kitchen to the house and this was the dining room. So, um, you know, we're proposing inside very minor modifications to bring plumbing in. This represents the total extent of the changes that we wanna to make to the outside. On this floor, we've got um, one uh, window here that we don't believe is original, we wanna block up and uh, we want to make an opening here and there is an existing opening here that we think was not original that we wanna modify. And then upstairs, again, very similar, very few plan modifications. We'd like to put a new window here and sorry, a new window here. And then um, no changes up in the attic, the wonderful attic. So, oh, sorry. 
The section is very simple. Sorry. Not sure what's going on. We'll skip that. I'll just run around the house very quickly. This is the existing north elevation facing 2nd Street. Um, very troubling to me is the absence of windows here. There's no indication that uh, there ever were windows there given the layout of the house, but there's a lot of indications from Davis projects that he put uh, either a blind recess or a window opening with a false window with glass and a kind of vitrine situation behind it or shutters. So we uh, believe that the correct thing to do is to do that here. So what we're proposing is to put back, you know, these are existing basement windows. So it's pretty clear to us that the double hungs were replacements. So we'd like to put uh, casement windows in these openings. And we'd like to basically make false openings here where we think there would have been something. And then as per the historic report, we'll do all the drip molds over the windows as there, you know, we have existing uh, examples of all of that material. So we're just gonna presumably match, match all the historic material. Then all of the verge boards, we have the witness marks. And fortunately we do have 20th century photographs. They made it through until the 1930s, I think. And my dream is we're gonna be able to bushwhack our way down the hill behind the house and find what's left of the original verge boards in the spring. In the meantime, the same guy who's doing all the woodwork at the train station, he's reproduced the train station verge boards as per the photographs. And we have those in the warehouse here ready to go up. And he would be doing the verge boards and all of this rickrack here. And then, you know, this is gonna be typical what I'm saying for all the facades, but on the chimneys, which were, I believe, rebuilt under a prior approval, we found from <clears throat> superior clay tile in Ohio, a chimney pot that matches in size and shape the chimney pots that appear in the 20th century photographs. So that, in effect, is our agenda. There's a limestone base that we're going to clean up. And then moving around the building, this is the current Second Street elevation with a strange window here, nothing here. Um, those of you who know the building know there's a relieving arch here. And the original building did have a tripartite window that appears in that engraving I showed you. So this would be our proposed elevation for 2nd Street, where we're actually modifying that opening that's on the ground floor and proposing a new opening here because I've never found a Davis house that has a projection that doesn't have some sort of a locally symmetrically composed facade. So this is my best attempt at what he would have done if I could channel his spirit. And this, we have quite a bit of evidence of this window and how it existed. And there's a lot of evidence that this was a favorite device. There's a room divider here. So he would do this and get a monumental effect, but have a very different effect inside. And to conclude my lecture on the subject, these houses were all about new ways of making plans. So uh, you all, Chip knows that he can give a lecture on that topic, but this was a revolution in architecture. I think this house is 1835 to 1837, but I'm not an expert. If it is, next to the Blythewood Gate House, it's one of the most important early Gothic buildings in America. So that is, in my fantasy, what we're renovating here. And then just to wrap it up, this is the south facade where now there's a big cutout here. And I can't find any evidence of what was there, but other buildings that I've seen suggests that it was a conservatory and it had, you know, this was built by Charles Alger who owned the ironworks uh, or rather he owned it for a time. So it's logical that it would have had some iron components. So we're proposing a nice kind of tracery conservatory here and rebuilding this projection here as Davis might have built it, you know, uh, with a, with a nice entry and then a very simple utilitarian steel step here as light as possible. And then the entire building uh, would be covered in stucco. So I think that's my presentation. Thanks very much, Walter. Ladies and gents. 
Walter, <clears throat> I think it looks terrific. And I know there's so many of us here in Hudson were always very anxious about what would um, happen here. Um, regarding the stucco on the outside, would you also do sort of that Ashler stone effect that's in the illustration? I haven't gotten that far. That's a really interesting question, Paul, because, you know, for instance, the um, some of the Davis houses that were executed, especially in the South, they're that kind of pebble dash stucco. You know, I think it's called pebble dash. You know, it's got little stones in it. Then others do have that. I'm totally open to that. And I assume ownership is also, if the board had a preference, um, if it was feasible, I'd be happy to do it. I mean, obviously, at least the engraver thought that that was the appropriate way to show the house. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, did you discuss the roof material? Um, well, the roof material I'm told had been determined at an earlier meeting and that synthetic slate or slate oh, right. was permissible. Right. Okay. So we're still, I was interested to hear, I wrote down Inspire Roofing. Um, we used a product that Chad recommended on the uh, depot, which is a rubber roofing, which is very attractive on the de depot. Um, and it might be the right thing here. Although the diamond pattern is very much in evidence in some photographs, and it's hard to say whether that was historic or whether that was a, you know, they made those asbestos uh, shingles that were very popular in that pattern. So I, I would, again, I think we're open to any suggestions, any direction. If you think the diamond pattern is right, and I'm going to defer to others who have more knowledge of the historic house than I do. There is, we had a house on East Allen Street that had this diamond roofing. They had a fire and they were able to find contemporary asbestos roofing tiles that had this shape and look. So if you're interested in that, it does exist today. Yes, yes that's a great idea that even if it was synthetic, Again, I think the one of the architects made the comment the roof was up in the air 30 feet. This is way up there, but of course you're gonna see it's a very prominent right. roof. So the color and the pattern, you'll see it from a lot of areas down below the in the area around the station. It's gonna be very- Actually, different. I mean asphalt, not asbestos, of course. Yeah, so no, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I yeah. think the color and the texture is almost more important than the actual material. Uh, Walter, uh, thank you for this terrific uh, presentation. Um, I'm really curious about the projection on the east side where you're proposing the new windows on the first and second floor. And certainly stylistically, it seems um, um, it, it's, it's consistent uh, <clears throat> with the building, but in the, uh, in the, uh, early engraving, <clears throat> it shows no openings. <clears throat> and it, it, did, it is a very peculiar floor plan that there would be this bay projection <clears throat> with, no, with no windows. Uh, it's, it's kind of an oddity. There's no other evidence found in the building that suggests what that, why that niche is there and what that was used for and why there are no windows in it? No, um, it, you know, it appears like, you know, a bad architect forgot the closets and they added a closet to two rooms, but that of course would be absurd. Um, I have three theories and uh, I don't know which one is correct, maybe none of them. My first theory is that this engraving was done uh, 20 or 30 years after the house was built and it had already been modified. They switched to double hung windows because it looks like some double hung windows in the engraving. But then inside the house, there are pockets, you know, where the casement windows could be opened in against and they're not shutter pockets, they're window pockets. So, so this could have had windows that were filled in. Um, 
it could have been water closets because I found that very early in the 1830s, they were experimenting with having the servants pump water up to a cistern on the roof and having early flush toilets. But the, the space in there isn't really uh, convenient for that. It doesn't make sense. There's a, a vent here on the third floor that doesn't appear to have ever had glass in it. It's just a quatrefoil opening. So my theory for a while was this was a kind of ventilation shaft that was drawing bad air out of the basement, but then they happen to have two windows there. So that doesn't make any sense. So I, I'm fresh out of theories. If you guys know, all I know is it doesn't look good without a window there. And AJ Davis wouldn't have done a blank facade. There's no evidence in any facade that Davis did. He might leave that blank and he might leave that blank, but if it sticks out, it's got to have at least a little fleshette that you can shoot people with. You know, they might have wanted to make that more of a tower and they ran out of money. I, I don't know, but my approach, because we don't have infinite budget, is to try and make it look like it wasn't a mistake. Um, <clears throat> there is also an early photograph uh, taken of this, uh, well, I should say a 20th century photograph, it's not an early photograph, uh, this building taken oh, while there was a fire on Allen Street, uh, like two or three doors to the east of, of this house. Yeah, I know that photograph. It's not in this presentation. I know uh -huh. that photograph. And that shows the window, the the, uh, the tripart window of the second floor, as I recall, in some oh. measure. Okay. And it might also suggest, I don't recall in that photograph if it looks like it's a stucco building at that time still, or if it's painted. I, I, I don't have that photograph in front of me right now, but it will be certainly interesting. And it gets to the question that Paul raised earlier about the uh, the stucco, the pattern of the stucco, mm -hmm. the the thickness of the stucco. You mentioned using this stucco as an insulative uh, technique for this building, which I think we have um, should we should we really need to have some really strong detailing about what that stucco is if it. If you're intending to use a synthetic foam-based stucco with a uh, with a um, a veneer of of uh, latex-based paint, basically, uh, that could be problematic for this building from a technical point of view in terms of creating a vapor barrier on the outside of the brick that could be um, injurious to the brick and to the structure of the building. If we're going to, if you're proposing doing a traditional stucco similar to the type of stucco that would have been originally placed on this um, directly over this brick, which breathes some moisture, um, um, I, I think we're very concerned about the thickness as it, you have in some of your details of it's it's actually your entrance portico, if you could scroll down to that, uh, the original details uh, with the- The photos. Uh, the photos, yeah, there you go. It's scrolling up, sorry, I think. Sorry. Um, no. I'll find it in a second, give me a second. Yeah. There it is. There, that's exactly it, thank you. So here you can see the um, yellow painted brick and the trim, the wooden trim uh, over the uh, door <clears throat> and so forth. And you think about, well, what is the thickness of the stucco that gets applied here? And how does it, um, with, these, uh, with these original uh, wooden features? So I think that the stucco thickness and pattern uh, is 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 really critical to this building, um, and um, and as uh, the put to to potentially 
do a legitimate restoration of that stucco would be something that would be an objective. I would hope that the board would support more so than um, a synthetic stucco. Um, I don't disagree with anything you said. Um, I mentioned in the uh, submittal that we'd like to use a Gutex system, which is a West German system that's made for exactly the situation. It's like a, um, a board, two inch board with a little channel behind it for water to run down. So it absolutely allows the wall to breathe. And then it does have a synthetic stucco on it, but it does not require the hated joints, which are what everybody in the world of architecture hates about synthetic stucco. Now, I would love to do just Structolite or a natural stucco on the outside and make this building a soft yellow again. We have to talk to Craig because I don't want to insulate inside where I have beautiful original moldings and details, you know. So my thinking is since we're remaking most of the um, window drip molds anyway, a column like you're talking about chip and that drip mold you're looking at, we could just move the whole thing out a little bit if we had to. But if you all said, we waived the New York State Energy Code and you guys don't have to worry about that, I'm very happy to do 100%. And I've done many buildings like that. I just didn't realize that was an option here. I, you know, I thought the choice was wreck the inside or the outside, basically. That's such an interesting question. Is it is it is that possible what, to get around the energy code for in, in in I mean there's a tension right between preservation and energy efficiency. You need how, to how look we no further than the double glass window, you know, where you're talking about tiny thin mullions versus things the size of asparagus. You know, it's um, it's the energy code makes everything thick, fat, bulbous because that's what you need. Yeah, I think it's a really, really interesting um, discussion. Um, I think that just as we have approved the insulated and uh, you know double pane glass, and now today a triple pane glass, um, I think energy conservation is an important uh, thing for us to address. I think it's a, it's kind of like the devil's in the details. Um, how well can this be executed? And how um, sensitively can it be executed? This is clearly a very, very important, um, a very, very important house. Um, and I sometimes liken um, the um, restoration of a house uh, to sometimes the restoration of an automobile. Um, you take a 1957 Chevy that, uh, convertible that's going to be restored and uh, decide, well, it needs to, uh, it, it needs to answer it with um, the pollution controls and the gas and the economy of a current standard automobile, uh, you know, a currently available automobile. Um, that is, um, um, th that's Im Im impossible and, and difficult. Um, and so here we are with a, a very, very important building and your approach is to its restoration is, is exactly what I'm sure everyone in the commission has been waiting for, for years. <laughs> hmm. um, 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 so uh, I, I just, I, I think, I think, I think the detailing of it, the, the, cons I, I, I would love to, for you, Walter, to be able to find that perfect solution that produces the energy conservation and also maintains the delicacy of the detailing of this building and the original design intent. Um, and um, um, so I think that these details are super, just, they're just super important. There must be a, but Chip and someone well better versed than I would know, there must be cases where the significance of a, of a, of a 
of a structure, right? Where it's where its role as a as a a work of art and historical significance uh, over outweighs uh, outweighs our societal need for um, for energy efficiency. And given that we have an architect and an owner who's 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 willing to restore it to such a level, is there a way to and I don't, I don't know. I don't know if this is a question for anyone. Is there a way to appeal this? Is there a way to get them? Is there a way to get them around things like energy efficiency code? I don't know the answer. Is this something that uh, Craig could uh, rule on, uh, or at least uh, somewhat rule on uh, after a conversation with Walter? Is Craig here to answer that? Because I'm not going to answer for Craig. Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the energy code does address historic buildings or buildings within an historic district. Uh, I would refer the design professional to chapter 11 of the building code, which will address that. Um, I know there's something in there regarding uh, Certification from Parks and Recreation Commissioner. Um, I don't know if that changed. I know that used to be in the 2010 code, but there is some some mechanisms that can get you around the um, energy compliance when it comes to historic integrity of a building. And there's different levels of it, whether it's a landmark or just within a district, and there's all kinds of different things, but it does address it. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, I would say that I can't speak for um, ownership, but my guess is they'd be delighted not to have to insulate this on the outside. I think we all agree it would be a much better way to approach this. So I'm happy to pursue that. I think Craig's given me uh, some ideas. So we'll see what we can do. Now, Walter, when you're saying insulate on the outside, is that... I, I guess I'm a little confused with what you're talking about. If you're talking about interior insulation, again, there's some mechanisms when it comes to historic buildings. Uh, I don't know what kind of insulation you're doing on the exterior. Well, I was thinking, Craig, there's a quite an efficient system that adds two inches that um, you know gives you quite a good rating on the outside, and so you'll get a credit for something, and you know. Uh, Chip raised some of the technical issues, and I think this addresses it. But if you ask me on a Davis house, would I rather have a West German thing made from recycled materials or synthetic stucco mined from somewhere outside of a hillside in Hudson? I, I, guilty. That's what I want. So let's, I'll, I'll work to that. That's given me some direction. I can take that to the bank and say the HPC wants us to explore this as a not doing a kind of modern insulation. And it is a cavity wall, so we could probably do something with that. And that's what I was gonna get at. You know, if you can obtain it from the interior in the cavity wall, you know, the exterior may not be as, well, as crucial. Again, um, uh, Chip, who knows a tremendous amount about this, probably more than I do, mentioned moisture migration to the wall. I just worry that that cavity in that wall was intended to remain empty for a reason. If we, we pack it with stuff, you know, I've heard about buildings being sopping wet 20 years later. So I, this is over my pay grade. We'll have to find somebody who can give us a good opinion on how to do this, and we will. Well, the, the building code addresses that when you're talking about moisture and barriers and things of that nature. Um, the, the building code will address that. That's all considered vapor barrier things of that systems. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find it right now real quick in the code just to see if I can see that exemption for historic buildings and if so I'll refer it to. If not, we can talk about it down the road. Yeah. I mean but all I think I if you say, Craig, is I have a feeling the, everybody on this board would agree that they don't want us solving it on this wall, for instance, on the inside. I mean for obvious reasons, that's amazing detailing right there. You couldn't buy that now. Is, uh, Walter, is that, uh, is the plaster, uh, this is a brick bearing wall, I'm assuming, right? Not a veneer over frame. No, it's a two width uh, with an airspace 
very modern for England, 1830s wall. Yeah, so so there's an airspace, the plaster up on the on the brick by an inch or so on the interior, mm -hmm. uh, which it, again is is a bit of a a um, vapor release cavity, and it's also a um, uh, it, it it does provide an airspace insulation, a thermal lag between the inside and the outside. Uh, it's not insulation in a modern sense of the word, but it is. But I'm asking, it's not plaster directly. The interior plaster is not applied directly to the brick. No, no, it's on wood lath. Right. So what you're saying is true. And if we did stucco the outside and plaster the inside, you would imagine that it would give you a very tight envelope as long as the moisture condensed on the right side of wherever it's condensing. Right. And the Gutex, you know, that was something that we've used in other uh, applications where you want a nice smooth stucco effect, no lines, and mm -hmm. want it to look like a masonry building. It does. You can get the crisp details and everything. But mm -hmm. again, what you're saying, any historic stuff that we have would have to be removed and replaced. Whereas if we just stucco it, we go right to where we think the original stucco was. You can almost see that it was stuccoed in places. So that would be easy. Is, is there some evidence of the stucco surviving on the exterior of the building? I think that there's evidence in witness marks where things come forward of where stucco was. Now, interestingly, you know, um, uh, being a detective is not all it's cracked up to be because like, for instance, look at this, Chip. This doorway is off center with this Overdoor and also the thing above. In other words, look at what they did over here. Now, was that done originally or was that done when they pulled the stucco off and Second Street collapsed? Because I think you all know that Second Street collapsed. This poor little porch probably fell down when that happened and somebody stuck it up. Um, I don't know what to do about that because it's not very attractive, um, but it's historic. And I, you know, again, we'll, we'll see when we do the renovation, if this brick allows that this was original here, that'll tell us one thing. If it looks like this was moved, we'll know another. So once we actually get to a building permit and can get into the house, you know, we'll take it one step at a time and we'll go from inside anywhere we think there was an opening and see, you know, we'll do it properly. Walter, can I interrupt real quick? Sorry, Chip. I want to refer you to the uh, residential code section N1107.6. And it says no provisions of this chapter 11 relating to the construction, repair, alteration, restoration, and change of occupancy shall be mandatory for historic buildings. Then the only thing is I would say with that is go to chapter two of that code and look at the definition for historic building. Uh, okay. I'm pretty confident to say that it's not required to fire file it file energy compliance, but uh, Great. when you get onto the interior, it's highly recommended that you do obvious reasons, but I don't think you gotta worry so much about the exterior. Well, we're, is it okay if we restore the coal burning fireplaces, then it'll never get chilly. <laughs> Let's not get too carried away here. You could do that, but now you gotta meet the mechanical code because the mechanical code won't give you an exemption for exterior. <laughs> so be careful. Yeah, and, and more no coal. Venting and Thomas, no coal. <laughs> well, you can do it, just make sure it beats the mechanical <laughs> code in the building. And it's delivered by somebody named Tiny Tim. Okay. <laughs> Craig, uh, this is Phil. Just just to be clear on, on where we're at, is are are we are we close to being able to say to you, Walter that uh, that there's a workaround in in terms of of energy code or an exemption or some aspect of an exemption that would allow him to go forward uh, with his preference, which is to, to limit uh, the insulation actually both inside and out. Uh, yes, as far as the the definition of this particular property. Um, but obviously he's going to have to provide that information to the building department during their plan 
and reference that section of the code. So when the plan review is done, we're not trying to figure out what they're going to do with insulation. And okay. To, just to so close, the loop, Greg, does the um, HPC need to certify that this is worthy of such consideration or do we just say it is and that's it? If it's the exterior of the building, that's in review. If it's interior, no. The only time it would be interior is if it's a designated landmark, which I don't think this building is. Well, I'd like to fix that, but we'll talk about that later. But but we we can provide a note from the commission that uh, that uh, uh, that we recognize the significance of this building within our own historic. Uh, district, uh, just as it is, uh, because, for example, being uh, the Alger House, uh, that in itself could be a legit criteria for individual designation, uh, an important owner, significant owner, and the uh, probability that uh, the great A.J. Davis was involved and so on. And we can we can prepare a letter uh, to that end and can actually be pretty factual. It seems like this would have all of the criteria for individual designation in place. It just hasn't been designated. And is that the owner's responsibility? Does he apply for that if he wants to yes. apply for it? Yes, but but, uh, but we can we, we can that work? we can prepare a supporting letter, and then the owner would have to go to a. I don't remember whether it's Preservation League, but it's there's a straight up application. But that we we can make it an individually designated uh, building within our historic district, specifically for the city of Hudson, and that might yeah. be something, that might be something the commission could do. I'm, I I don't mean to digress. I'm trying to figure out. We got a couple more apps to do, and I want to want to move this forward as I often do. So uh, what what's the bidding on this? We have we have Craig's view that that within the various codes there's uh, a pretty good shot that uh, we can talk about this building in such a way that that we don't do damage uh, by by trying to apply an, another code which is uh, the insulation and energy. Uh, so I I urge us to go with that in terms of uh, trying to uh, Sherlock Holmes our way into, into uh, a fenestration solution that actually makes a lot more sense uh, than, uh, than uh, uh, in, in the, the engraving, in fact, what, what would have been, which is part of what that detective work is about. I'm sensing that the board is, is in agreement with uh, Walter's theory of the case uh, in terms of what would have been uh, A, because it's it's quite aesthetic, symmetrical, uh, and B, it's consistent with what he believes uh, for good reason Davis would have done. So what else is in the way? I'm asking you all to, to moving forward, uh, finding the application complete if we can, uh, and letting these yeah. guys get on with work. I, I think that I, I think that there's um, first I think we are, we uh, the board can be um, I, I would recommend to the board to be very supportive of the application uh, and um, I think that this is a very very important building and I think as Walter has pointed out there's still a great deal of investigation and information to learn about this building I think that we should accommodate the applicant. Uh, uh, to allow them to move forward uh, at the same time as we have a disclaimer in many of our other uh, approvals, discovery uh, needs to be brought back to the uh, commission for review. And, uh, you know, I think that it would be an, a tremendous educational experience for all of us on the board to have Walter walk us through all of the discovery that he makes on this building. I think it would be important for all of us to learn these things. Um, so um, I think we've, I, I think regarding the stucco, I, I think that we should maybe reserve approval of the stucco because I think we need to know more about the technical aspects of it, but also we need to know a little bit more about the aesthetic aspects of it and what it, <laughs> Uh, what the impact will have with the 
other uh, trim and the roof line and the roof overhang and all the other uh, extant uh, trim that's there. I'm a little worried about adding two and a half inches or so to the uh, to the brick uh, because then what do we what happens with the limestone base? Is that something that then gets? Oh, there's, this is premature to find it complete. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, um, so I, I would I, I would propose that we could uh, um, find a way to proceed along those lines. So you're suggesting allowing the moldings and the windows, but um, not finding it complete as to the exterior wall treatment. That's well, what I'm I think. Hearing. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, if that works for Walter, I mean, I think that. They, these two things have to work together from a technical point of view. And Walter's going to need to know what the approach is for the stucco to do any final kind of execution of the drip moldings and the other trim. So uh, I, I, I think that, but the, I just want to say quickly, you know, we have these existing casements and whether this was stuccoed or not, we're keeping all of this. So if we can put the windows in, then we can put the stucco on or not at any time. So I'm just saying yeah. that. Would be okay. A bit of a let, well, that's that's super good. You've got the physical evidence of the location of the plane of the casement windows, and we are assuming that these casement windows are inward swinging and uh, nested into those niches in the interior. Is that correct? That is my belief. And if that changes, I'll let you guys know. I mean, some okay. swing in and some swing out. That was either for shutters or casements, but it doesn't, you know, if you look on the street, it doesn't really make sense that they just swing a casement out into the street. I think they would have had a shut, closed shutter so they could open the windows into the room and have the air, but the privacy. So that's yeah. what we're assuming. So to, to, to uh, just clarify, probably just for me, to, to follow this, uh, Walter can't do any of this stuff uh, without uh, some uh, kind of C of A from us because he can't get the work permit. We're the, the gateway uh, for, for, uh, for this project and, and, and so on. So the, the idea of proposing a C of A and excluding uh, the stucco however we want to define an exterior surface makes a hell of a lot of sense to me as a way of, of moving this project forward. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a clarification, Walter, on what I said about uh, individual designation within the city of Hudson. It, it occurred to me that uh, we just did that uh, with, uh, with Shiloh Baptist. Uh, the owner or uh, someone working with the owner would prepare the documentation according to the code, uh, city code, which describes the criteria. And that would uh, get approved by the HPC. Uh, we would then forward that uh, in the form of a resolution to the common council. And the common council has the sole authority to expand or contract or define historic structures. So there's a process in place and we just did it. It's pretty straight up. I, I have a question because this is a, con I assume this is a contributing structure in the existing district. What, what benefit is there at this point to individually designating it? Uh, from from a city point of view, I, do, I don't think it, it adds or deletes anything from a uh, preservation league or other entities. It may create uh, additional opportunities for uh, funding. Got it. But, you know, just it's not my building, so I'd have to ask the owner and make sure they're fine with it. And Under, understood, Walter. I just didn't want to leave that page blank. There no, is a way perfect. forward. I think that's perfect. We've got options. And, right. and that's in no way a condition of this C of A. It's just a suggestion. It has nothing to do with this C of A. I had given Walter an incomplete answer. I was trying to fill in my incomplete. It was a good answer. Chairman, as a member of the public, if by your indulgence, this is Ronald Kopnicki, I would like to be heard on this matter. I'd like to make a comment before you vote on any certificate of appropriateness. 
If you'd keep it short, Ronald, you're yes. on. Given the significant, I would, I'm going to make one statement and Matt McGee will make a brief statement. Given the That's, significance. Hey, Ronald, the, I, we just agreed to one. Just right. Well, we're on the same it. machine. So uh, there's no way we can get around it. Given the significance of this building, before you vote on any certificate of appropriateness involving such things as details of fenestration, I think a public hearing should be calendared to permit the interested public to digest the proposal and respond to it. And I am concerned about the fenestration, particularly of the tower. That is not correct. Uh, it is ahistoric to think that that would not be blank. The house is based on houses of the English period in the early 16th century, 17. uh, 17th century, 1600s, that's what <laughs> I meant to say. And I believe that this would be a serious uh, infringement on the original design by A.J. Davis. And I think that uh, some a few other matters should be clarified and discussed better and more fully because some of it is just wrong and inappropriate. And this is a very important building. It is probably one of the most important in Hudson. There are others that are equally, and I would say there are a few that are more important, but this is, is really a, a sorry, and a shame to do all this work on this building and and alter it into something inappropriate. I, I think this should be taken to public hearing. I have documented quite a bit about this building and it was actually built around 1852. The owner that had it built and designed had A.J. Davis build two houses for him and I think that it is truly important and it's America's greatest architect of the 19th century and we should protect it as fully as possible. And I think this is highly irregular not to have a public hearing and not to delve into this more carefully. You're, you're making an assumption that uh that there's not going to be one. There was no, no, not even discussion of it. We, we haven't even gotten to that, but thank you. That said, uh, City Attorney Victoria, your, your thoughts on uh, public, well, we, we, it'll, we'll go through our process, it, but uh, do, you, do you have a point of view? Well, yeah, I mean, the code says the commission may waive a public hearing for minor cosmetic alterations. Um, you know, given the extent of the improvements here, um, I think it would be reasonable for the board to hold a public hearing. Thank you. I support the idea of a public hearing. Yes, me too. It's really sure. significant. Okay. Uh, then uh, that that would be uh, that would be uh, our our next step. Uh, if if uh, the board feels that way in general, uh, do we want to make a specific motion to that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll make a motion that uh, that we schedule a public hearing. I'm I not second. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Let me figure out uh, a date uh, if we can do it. Uh, the end of the month it depends on what else is is coming up. Otherwise, it would be uh, it would be uh, the first meeting in March. Uh, but that's that's the the direction so we, we have from the board. We should pick the date now when you schedule the hearing, so the public has um, since the board voted on it. Uh, I would I would actually like to do it in uh, in March if that's possible. We're trying to keep the second meeting of the month for. Uh, Oh, it's on seeds of A, but but it's it's no big deal. Commissioners, you all have a strong feeling one way or another. Do you want to try to do it at the end of the month? Yeah. So is that March twelfth? March twelfth. Yeah. That that would give um Mr. Chatham more time to do the I agree. 
for you as well. I agree. Uh, then I'll take direction from uh, from the board to uh, send out notice uh, of a public hearing for March 12th. Good. Okay. Is there any further business we need to conduct on this application or uh, can we move on? Okay, we're gonna move on then. Thank you, Walter. Thank you all, thank you so much. That was, uh, as always, pretty brilliant stuff, thank you. Uh, we have uh, 223, 225 Allen Street. Uh, who will be speaking for that uh, building? Hello, this is Sokol with Matthew Cardona Architect. How are you today? Doing well, how are you guys? Terrific. So you've, you've been here a bit, so you see what uh, the process is. If you could give us a top line on, on what your project's about and then share your screen, please. Sure, absolutely. I'll start my screen now. And just to iterate from last um, uh, meeting, um, I just wanted to kind of go over the overall. Uh, we did present this project. Um, it was well received. And as you guys remember, there was one item that was still not figured out 100%, um, and that was the entry door. Uh, the doors that we proposed last time were more of a colonial style doors. And since we we changed the doors and we've been in talk with um, his um, State Historic Preservation Office and we have come up with a more uh, Greek Revival appropriate doors. And this is the design here that we're proposing. Um, there will be, uh, the surrounding will still be the same. We are restoring the uh, side lights and the transoms. Um, no changes there. The only change would be the actual doors. Okay. And that was the only issue, as I recall, the commission had suggested that what was initially considered was not appropriate and that a Greek revival door would be appropriate. Okay, show it to us. And that's the door that we're proposing if everyone can see the screen. And that's the only change from the previous presentation is the door itself, the surround and all that stuff is uh, what was presented? Correct. In, in my ignorance, tell me what, what, uh, what actually defines this as a uh, Greek revival because the so it's the, the single uh, panel right. um, that's been used. It's more simple. Um, and to the other uh, presentation that we had, it was more of a colonial. So it had uh, multiple panels where this yeah. is a, um, a more straightforward uh, Greek revival and it keeps all the verticals. Got it. Commissioners, any questions or comments? Uh, as I understand it, we had actually requested that the applicant come back with this and and uh, they have. Cool. We have a motion to find the application complete. Anyone? Hugh, thank you. A second. Uh, Miranda, thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye approved. Uh, motion to uh, waive a public hearing and request the city attorney to prepare a C of A. Anyone? That motion. Thank you very much, Paul. And a second. second. Thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, done. We'll have a C of A in two weeks. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for coming back. Thank you. And, and appreciate your working with us on this. Thank you for your time. I have 542 Warren Street. Uh, who's speaking for 542 Warren Street? Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, Doug Huntington with Barless Woodlick Architects. Hi, Doug. Good morning. Good morning. Have you um, been with us all the, all the morning so far? 
<laughs> I have been. It's been Perfect. very, very uh, interesting discussion. So I've, I've, I've actually list, I've seen a, a few of those projects uh, before too. So it's always, uh, always a treat to see how uh, how they develop too. So I'd be excited to, for them all to take the next steps. Thank you. Um, so I'll share my screen here. Uh, our project is uh, one I'm sure you're all familiar with um, at, at 542 Warren. So the, 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 the uh, old Barlow Hotel. So kind of uh, just uh, between fifth and sixth and um, uh, with, the, with the municipal parking lot behind and then uh, pedestrian access uh, along the uh, along the, the long end of the the, the, the structure there, um, so just a, a simple front elevation. And and what we're proposing are some some minor repairs and uh, a few a few uh, just minor cosmetic changes to the exterior here. So. Um, we, in our historical research, we, we did able, we were able to find uh, a couple of images here. The, the original building was built in <clears throat> 19, I think it was finally completed in 1927, but this was uh, a picture from 1926 before the, before the, the cornice work was, was completed and, uh, and this next to at the time the the uh, the old Farmers National Bank, which I think burned in 1927, and uh, and was rebuilt with the bank building that is there today. Um, here's the the new structure to the right, and and the the existing Barlow Hotel, which I think was went through a substantial renovation in in 2013. Um, and, uh, the owner is the new owner is, is planning to really just uh, is not making any significant changes, um, to the interior or to the exterior, but is just trying to, uh, to freshen it up and, and work with their, uh, with their concept, um, of, uh, of the, of the hotel and the rebranding of it. So just to zoom in on a couple of the, the details, there will be a new sign that we will you know, submit, submit at a later date as some of the graphics and, and pieces are, are being finalized, but we are gonna replace the, the sconces here in the, in the front entry vestibule. Um, all of this woodwork is gonna be remain um, in place. Uh, there's just some, there's some areas of brick um, that are had a parge coat uh, applied to them that has fallen into disrepair, and we're planning to uh, planning to restore that parge coat and uh, and and clean this up a little bit. Similarly, the windows, the window details, the trim work, these the sills are all going to be. Uh, going to get repainted and, and refreshed to a um, couple of just small repairs on the railings here as well. And then the facade itself is going to be repainted, um, re repainted. So on the rear elevation too, uh, I think the rear it's side elevations, no real work other than some tuck pointing um, to repair some brick on the on the side elevation, and the rear is going to uh, have we'll show you from the proposed here in a moment, but have some uh, shutters applied to the rear. Um, they're going to re replace these sconces here with a similar sconce that is that is on the front, and and reskin the awning here that was I think damaged in a in a fire. Uh, I think within the last year or so. Um, and, and so shutters was gonna be part of our, uh, our proposal for this, the front and rear elevations. And so we, 
pulled uh, just a few uh, a few images from some some structures that uh, are on Warren Street. We're planning to to kind of to do the the the, truck, the shutters in in uh, proportional to the windows, so that they are either going to fully cover the window, the size to fully cover the window, or um, or half of the window, just so that they're proportionally um, proportionally appropriate. And so here is just a, a, a quick rendering of of kind of the the existing and proposed. So repainting the existing cornices, um, trim work around the windows, and um, and then adding the adding the sh adding fixed uh, fixed louvered shutters on on the windows on the front. Um, we'll be reskinning the awning uh, with a with a, with a, a new material. It's going to be a navy a navy color, uh, a material a, a, a umbrella material, and uh, and then adding some some brass posts, uh, replacing the existing kind of uh, aluminum posts with brass posts, and the existing ones are a little uh, have been. I guess uh, damaged over the years. The awning's leaning a little bit, so so straighten that up with um, with some new posts and give it some brass accents that then I'll, that uh, kind of complement the the new fixtures and the, the concept for the interior spaces. On the rear or on the side elevation here, just uh, showing the existing reskinning of that uh, the existing awning in place. Uh, we were going to add a, a fabric panel on the underside of this awning um, that that could be illuminated and and help with uh, some. Uh, it does get a little dark and and a little bit of a tripping hazard in the evening, so we wanted that to illuminate the underside of that and also kind of hide some of the ugliness of the the structure that is supporting that that uh, existing awning. And uh, on the rear here, adding some, adding some shutters into these existing bricked in windows. There won't be any, any windows behind those, but just, just to kind of I'll give the, the rear entry here, uh, make it a little bit more aesthetically pleasing from the, from the municipal, municipal lot where many people you know, park and, and approach and uh, and giving it some relationship to the to the front to the front elevation as well, and and then uh, reskinning the awning that is that's on the rear. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that that you all have. Thank you, Doug. Just so uh, I understand, the 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 there some of these items are, are quote unquote permanent and definitely fall within code but but uh no, they're not a lot of structural changes it is if i understand it correctly essentially window trim uh shutters uh new awning uh new fabric uh or or the appearance of a new awning and new fabric uh metal support structure uh new and improved for that awning uh, and uh, a new identity, new signage. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't see any other uh, "quote unquote" structural changes that were being. Oh, and and repointing. Right. As Correct. needed. Okay. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, forgive me. I just needed the recap to follow what where you were going. Commissioners, thoughts or comments? you you are on mute there. sorry yeah i think it looks great i think it's a real a real uh improvement on the building looking forward to it uh, um can i can is the is the brick painted and i apologize if i if i miss that like is the brick is the facade painted right now yes the existing you know, the existing facade does is is painted okay okay uh Unless there there is anything else, uh, I'll yeah, ask. I, 
Yes, could, please, Chip, go could ahead. I just ask um, um, Craig to uh, weigh in on the awning um, since it's being, I don't know what the code requirement is for the awning. I, I mean, obviously there's an awning there now, so it may be not a zoning issue, but um, given that the columns are being replaced and, and the ceiling is being placed in it and there is substantial amount of work being done to it. I just wonder what the, uh, what the uh, zoning ordinance is for, um, for an awning that covers the sidewalk like that with a structure. It's unique in Hudson, that's all. Uh, in what sense, Chip? You feel it comes far out on the sidewalk relative to some of the others? There, there are not many awnings that are actually supported by the sidewalk. They are awnings that hang out yeah. off the building. Um, no, I understand. But I'm, it's more a point of curiosity than anything else. And I guess for the commission, uh, one, of the, one of the worries I have about placing a ceiling in that, and I understand the desire of not seeing the structure of it, but it, it, uh, I just, I worry about the amount of light if the light is not regulated, it gets to be too bright. And it, it's making a visually, by putting a ceiling in it that's gonna be backlit, the question of the commission is, does it make a bigger, does it make it a bigger thing than just what it already is visually? Okay, so if, if Craig is on, I, I think he should take this. I assume that the existing uh, Awning was code, but but he should comment on that. I really don't want us to get into code issues. Craig, I, yeah, I, 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 if I could just add, I, I in our research we did find that this awning, the existing awning, was uh, was there was a it was approved. There was a application filed with the with the zoning the ZBA when they installed it and uh, so it was approved at that time about you know about 10 years ago okay thanks Doug yeah but but with with that said that will be reviewed and discussed with our attorney as well and probably our zoning attorney because there's other things is the occupancy use of this building changing uh part of the reasoning for that awning to be there is because I believe right in front of it is a no parking zone so if that's all or any of that's going to be altered, then the zoning approval, to my knowledge, will have to come back into play for a new review. And there's reasonings for it because if these posts are blocking uh, accessibility to a parking space, such as people opening and closing their doors, uh, then that awning won't be able to be designed the way it is. So th there's, there's a few legality issues that I'm going to need to know and review it with our attorneys. Craig. I also, yeah. oh, sorry, I just, I want to sympathize with Chip's comment about the light under the awning. I think it's great to provide a little extra light on the sidewalk, but I think with the, there are regulations about lighted signs in Hudson. And in a way this could give off quite a bit of light, which would really change the look of this building. I'm wondering if there's another way of solving that with sconces affixed to the front of the building or something like that. Rather than in the interior of the canopy? Rather than rather having the can, I mean, or could we regulate how bright it is? I, I think Chip made a very good point. So the, in general, I think it's the planning board that would review the, the light emanating, right? The lumens and and your board generally reviews the fixtures appropriateness. Mm -hmm. That seems right. I just want to make sure we're not veering too far off. Of, right. um, I just know, know that it's come up in the past when dealing with signs that are backlit and whether they are appropriate in the historic district. So it's not a sign, it's a different kind of structure, but I just think it's worth thinking about. But Do you raises have... the question that whether or not uh, it, it makes sense for us to actually find the application complete. Craig is saying that that uh, uh, that zoning uh, will have to weigh in on on the, the structure of the canopy and, and maybe other issues. And 
uh, both Miranda and Chip are suggesting or implication would be that uh, planning may may have to weigh in on on lighting. So uh, with that, I'm not I'm not clear how we should uh, whether it's helpful to the applicant to find the application complete. I, I would ask the applicant uh, uh, following up on Miranda's comment if the interior of the um, if the if if this uh, uh, awning canopy is going to be lit from within with the with the ceiling in it as proposed does that in fact light through the awning sign that says the whaler uh you know does that then make it a backlit sign or are, is that awning are those words on the awning are they opaque or are they backlit by the by the uh, light that's in, inside the canopy because then, as Miranda points out, it becomes a backlit sign uh, rather than uh, an applied sign, if you will. Yeah, no, the, the letters are, are going to be similar to what I think are, it, it's, it's printed onto a solid fabric. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe, depending on the, tr the, the color of that fabric, um, there is, there is a, uh, a very little light transmittance through that. So we were, the idea was that there, the lower, the, the underside of the, the awning was gonna have a lighter color, like a white that allows a little more light just to project down yeah. on the street and the top of it, um, you know, little yeah. to no. Little to I, no yeah, I think now just getting to the pure aesthetics of this which is more in the commission's purview you know if this if this going to result in this canopy being actually emitting light even as slight as it may be uh if it's a blue glow coming through the fabric of the sign i think that that's something that the commission ought to really consider particularly in light of i i mean i I hesitate to say this because it's a little bit, it's too strong, but to use the brass poles and to use the ceiling uh, in the awning and to have a little bit of light coming through the ceiling, uh, coming through the awning, it just feels like it, this uh, awning is being sort of pushed into a 1980s kind of thing rather than um, a Hudson kind of thing. So um, I, I hesitate. I hesitate to make the 1980s reference because it's not wholly fair, but I'm I'm look I'm just looking for words. I mean, Craig. I think we're we're not really having a problem with the canopy per se. It's the having it lit that's of concern to me. But anyway. but code may have a problem with the canopy per se. I, my my question for Craig is is are you are you okay from a code point of view of what's being presented? Uh, otherwise, it, it does not make sense for us to rule on this. The, from what I got in front of me, and I even had a conversation, if I remember correctly, with Doug regarding this, the proposal is identical to what's existing, except for <laughs> the color of the material is changing, the lettering on the material is changing, and they were going to change the support, the proposed uh, brass post. And then brass posts were supposed to be the same size and design and, and in the same exact location of what is existing. So if that is all the same, then there's not an issue. But there's nothing in a proposal to me regarding electric lighting in a fabric awning in a public way. I, I see nothing in that proposal. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, that needs to be addressed through the through the electrical building code because that's probably a pretty important thing when it comes to the electrical code. Uh, but as far as going back to the zoning question, if that awning stays identical in the same exact location and that location is not altered, the height isn't altered to anything of the original approval in the zoning, then it can be obviously replaced. Because it's grandfathered, Craig. I mean, if if I'm um, I'm getting a sense from the commission that if we were to start from scratch and this was just a blank sheet of paper, and we were advising uh, zoning, we wouldn't really encourage something uh, controlling that much sidewalk. 
but but it's existing there, and that would be more of a legal question for the area. It, it's existing, so let, let's kind of back up a little bit. If, if you go to the existing awning and say that one of them posts were to break, and if they were to come in and repair it with a brass post and put it right back in the same spot, then that's allowable because it's already has an existing approval. Got it. But if they were to come in and move that post or, or alter the height or the location of anything that was approved in an existing regulatory approval, then they would have to go back to seek a new approval. It's the same thing with Textoric. If, if they wanted to change something that's an existing approval, then it has to go back to that, that, that regulatory body for a new approval. And that's what I'm looking at here. What I'm looking at, everything's the same. It's staying in the same spot. It's got the same height. It's got the same theoretically design. The material is changing, such as the post. But more importantly, there's nothing about electric in this. Nothing. So I would not approve this from a building code perspective until I see a plan for that electric. Just for clarification, my I don't have a problem with the awning or with brass poles on the awning. I think that's fine. My only issue is about the lighting. Well, we we could uh, approve this and move it forward, uh, contingent on and create a contingency for the C of A relative to to uh, Craig uh, signing off on the electrical solution, or we can find, we can object to the electrical solution, I believe, if, and, 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 and see where, where, uh, where that goes. D Doug, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, well, I, I think, you know, we would, we would certainly appreciate um, an approval on, you know, the remainder of what what is being proposed here um if 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 there's a contingency for the light i think um i think we'd be we would be we would be okay to to provide more information on this i i know the, the owner does want to to try to move forward and secure you know some you know to can and per, can and get some some contractors lined up to do this work as soon as possible so, but but understand your concerns about the the light, and and we could work with Craig on getting him what he would need for for that information. Okay, so I would I would be interested in a motion uh, uh, to to start with to find the application complete, uh, excluding the the resolution pending on the on uh, the the lighting solution. Uh, may I have that motion? Yes, yeah, so Miranda. moved. That's fine. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you very much, John. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, none. Uh, again, with, with the contingency as stated, uh, we can request the, the uh, city attorney uh, presuming uh, two things, one, as Craig was very clear that that structurally dimensionally, this is a like for like uh, solution uh, on the awning and the support structure in terms of scale and the other elements, obviously different color, et cetera, different signage, but a like for like solution uh, and to the contingencies is uh, resolved. Uh, I would take a motion going forward to request the city attorney to prepare uh, a certificate of appropriateness uh, to be available in two weeks, again, pending resolution of uh, the lighting situation and confirmation from the applicant and Craig that what we're being presented in the awning is like for like. Chairman, are you asking him to return to this board to present whatever the lighting is? No, it's a, it's a, it, well, actually, the good point, Victoria. I was not, uh, my, my head's not so clear. I, I think that that we can we can write this up as a contingency, but he will need to come back at that meeting. Okay, uh, so he needs to return to show you the light. Yes, we want Would it to be helpful to have some kind of lumens for whatever's proposed so everyone can understand. 
that would be helpful too, so that we could have some sense of brightness compared to ambient light or other street lighting. And personally, I would like to suggest that the owner and the architect consider some kind of lighting that's affixed to the building instead of this illuminated awning, because I think it would be much more in keeping with the historic style of the building. I mean, they can do what they want, but personally, I think that that would be much more appropriate. Yeah, there, there were two, two sconces, I believe, up near the, that I think here near the front right. door. Right, they're inside. And I understand you're wanting to get some light onto the sidewalk. I think that's a good thing. But something that is basically inside a, a, a roof of the awning that looks like fluorescent light going down on the sidewalk, I think might be jarring in front of such a beautiful historic building. Yeah, well, the, the, the intention would definitely be to make it a very subtle, a subtle light, but we can... Well, we talk can about it with your owner and think about what, yeah. what seems to make sense to you. We're, Doug, we're, tr we're trying to move you forward, but we reserve the right to re-examine the lighting solution. That sounds, uh, that's fair. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so moved that, uh, that the applicant will come back in two weeks. We will have a, a C of A ready to go, but we reserve the right to, uh, review the lighting solution at that, at that meeting. Uh, may I have such a motion to direct the city attorney. Make that motion. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and a second, please. Second. Okay. Thanks, Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Uh, terrific guys. So Doug, thank you very much for, for uh, hanging with us. I look forward to, to seeing what you come up with. Thank you for your time. Okay, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't know about you guys. I'm getting a little tired and uh, the dog's crying in the other room and, uh, and the world is annoying. Um, so I'm thinking we adjourn. Sounds Through good. Is, is anyone opposed? <laughs> no. no. I, I, I. Uh, it, it's I do. Well. What great. an amazing meeting, though. Can you believe, really? like, with the thing, the things we saw today? I know. Quite incredible. I know. Right. It was like a magical mystery tour of of Hudson <laughs> architecture. Really. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank all. you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>